What's up, everyone? Welcome in another new edition of Celtics Beat. Adam Kaufman, you know, Evan Valenti, of course, and Sean Devaney, good friend of the program, hopping in with us. How are you, buddy? Good. You're almost at 400 episodes. I mean, I can't believe they kept your oh, man. So it, what the heck? Well, I mean, in fairness, I think I started at like 250. So it, <laughs> it was a big built in number before I even arrived. So yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be too much longer before they realize they could they could do better elsewhere. Probably just hand it over. <laughs> no, now. no, no. no. Here's, here's, here's to 400 more. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So uh, look, I'd, I'd love to start on a high note, guys. I really would. But it is Thursday, as we mentioned, we are on the heels of you know as we record this thing 12 hours or however long ago removed from this what was really it was it was a bad it was a bad Celtics loss in Sacramento you know for as much as that was a good win against Golden State the night before which it really was and I get like it's it's really easy to look at it and say okay no Kemba Walker no Marcus Smart no Peyton Pritchard I mean you're basically without a point guard and Jeff Teague I mean I couldn't have been more wrong about what this guy was going to give to the team I was so high on the Jeff Teague edition and he has just been absolute crap so far to start off this year that and it doesn't mean he can't turn things around by the way he's still an NBA vet but so far terrible and he was bad again last night and the team was just it was bad 11 point lead in the third five point lead in the fourth and five's not a lot I get it NBA you know game of runs and all that stuff but just bad fouls silly mistakes defensive lapses it's I guess what impressed me so much about the Golden State win wasn't so much that it was a great win over a great team because Golden State is 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 fairly mediocre even though they are led by Steph Curry but it was the kind of game like the Sacramento game that I sort of have come to expect them to lose, you know, like they, they're on top for a while and then things kind of unravel and they fall apart and you look at it and it's a five point defeat, but they hung on, they held tough. They were resilient. They fought, they were solid. And then to just the very next night show their old war, Sean was, it was disconcerting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think if you looked at this road trip heading into it uh, and you looked at these first two games as a, you know, as a back to back to start this thing, uh, I think, you, you know, you, you probably would have said, you know, these two games, uh, if, if they can split them and then go in and, and, and find a way to beat Phoenix uh, and then win one of the other two games, you come out three and two and, you, and you're happy with it. So, you know, in that context, this is it's OK. You know, I mean, this is this is all right. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that. They should have won that game. You know, I mean, <laughs> you're right. It, it, this was one where they just shot themselves in the foot where where. Um, you know, for, for everything that they were missing, for everything that we lack, for every excuse you could make, if you just watch that fourth quarter and see the dumb fouls, you know, the and ones that they were giving up, uh, uh, you know, the reaching fouls, the, the, the mm. fouls, you know, that that was very, very frustrating. Uh, you know, just just just, just a win, really, that uh, uh, that they should have had. And, um, you know, this is a, a team, obviously, that is lacking in depth. I think that showed last night, uh, but uh, uh, you know you have to wonder over the course of this trip, does this loss set them off? Because you know they've got three winnable games, I think, but they also have three losable games here. So you know if this comes back as a one and four trip, uh, what a disappointment that would be. I agree with everything that you just said, with the exception of the lacking in depth part. And, that, and that's not to say Boston isn't lacking in depth. I guess where I'm quibbling is. You know, when you're missing three guys from your rotation, which they were in, in Smart and and obviously Kemba and Pritchard has been a fixture in that rotation when he's been healthy and maybe he returns to this next game against, against the Clippers. He's obviously getting close. I mean, you take three guys out of any team's rotation and you're going to look sure. like a totally different team. Yeah, uh, you know, I... I... I, I think uh, one thing that stood out to me is that that Tremont Waters is not ready for prime time. Uh, I, I think we saw that last night that, uh, you know, uh, I, I think a lot of these guys are going to miss the G League and, and not just him, but a lot of the guys who were who were sort of those two way players who, uh, you know, were, were doing well by by learning and playing a lot in the G League and then bringing that back to uh, to, to the big club uh, when, when they needed those minutes. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of guys around the NBA who, who are feeling that. And maybe, you know, as good as, as Tremont was in the G League last year, uh, you know, obviously MVP. I mean, he was as good as he got. Uh, you know, he, you, you can really see that he's lacking. So, you know, when I say a lack of depth, I guess that's what I mean is that, that you, you, you're winding up turning to a guy who's just not ready. And, uh, and, you know, obviously every team 
has that, but I, you know, the, the, the Celtics, when you look at their roster and the experience level of a lot of these guys, it's just not there. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do much, you know, wavering over last night's loss to Sacramento. I'm just not going to do that. I, when you're lacking three ball handlers, uh, it's, you know, Kemba with the minutes restriction, um, you know, smart with his, what, what seems to be a, a lucky, the fluky, not that big of an injury deal. Like considering I thought he snapped his Achilles after that second look at the, at the cap there, if him only be out two or three weeks is, is amazing. And no Peyton Pritchard. Like I didn't, I didn't really expect to win that. Uh, the, the, the Celtics to win last night. I didn't, I didn't expect one. I, when you're lacking that kind of ball handling um, and you're making Jason Tatum be point Jason, uh, Jeff Teague's getting minutes, like heavy minutes. Tremont Waters is getting heavy minutes. Carson Edwards is getting minutes. Um, it's just it, your whole offense is out of whack. What I liked, well, I'll tell you what I did like, like about last night's game is that Jason and Jalen were like, look, we're going to do this on our own. Um, there's going to be ways that, you know, you guys got to help us contribute just a little bit here and there, but we're going to take the majority of the shots and we're going to try and get this team to a win. They almost did. I mean, think about it this way. If they don't allow a stupid backdoor, uh, you know, open layup at the buzzer to tire to, to Halliburton and they count Jason or Jalen Brown's uh, goal 10, there's four points right there and there's a win. And you walk out of there thinking, Holy cow, the Celtics escaped Sacramento with a win without three point guards on their team. So I'm not going to get too upset over it. Again, I like the fact that that Jalen and Jason seem to be like, look, well, we got to do what we got to do to get this team through the regular season. There's going to be bumps in the road. Um, you know, we're coming off a game in, in, in golden state last night. Uh, we're playing on the West coast I and mean, there's just a lot of things that were in their favor. I'm not going to call it a schedule loss because normally I think they would win that game. Um, but they had no, you know, no answer for De'Aaron Fox. They had no answer for Halliburton. You know, that's a game normally where Buddy Hill goes crazy. I mean, you saw the, the stats pregame. Buddy's shooting like, what, uh, uh, 39 points per game the last three games against the Celtics. So you, oh, you knew awesome. that it was going to be an issue somehow, some way. Um, and, the, you know, there were – it's a winnable game, which makes it more frustrating for everybody. But when I sit here and look at it, it's like, look, you know, this team – Still hasn't been totally healthy yet. We haven't totally seen what this team is yet. But what I what I am enjoying is the fact that Jason and Jalen are continuing to pull this team along the, the however they need to do it through the regular season. And and like every team, if if you're not if you don't have the depth that you have signed to your roster or traded for, you're not going to go too far in the playoffs. If it's just Jason and Jalen by the time we hit the playoffs, yeah, they're going to be in trouble. But I'm still not I'm not reserving any judgment on anything I'm seeing until I see this team fully healthy for a stretch that's more than three games and and last night is included in that particular uh argument yeah and, and, you know just 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 to jump on that evan because uh you know well first of all i always i, I always forget that i gotta wear a tie on this show because <laughs> evan always, I mean, yeah, look, I i'm like, a, I'm here like here a, a western massachusetts lumberjack here but uh hey as a guy that lives in western massachusetts yeah. i'm appreciative of that look <laughs> man Okay. But, you know, the, the, the thing about the depth, at, especially at the point guard spot, though, is that can the Celtics rely on Kemba Walker? You know, you know to me, that's, you know, because, look, I don't think so. As good as he's been, he is he's, he's a rookie. And, and eventually the fact that he's going to be playing, you know, 72 games. But, uh, you know, you, whether it's I forget what it is, 15 or 16 games in this month. Uh, you know, so so he comes back, he's going to be put right into the fire and, and and he's never played this much. I mean, you know, nobody's really played this much, uh, but especially, you know, the rookies, that, that's going to be a lot to ask of him. And, and then you've got Kemba Walker. And is he ever going to be what Kemba Walker is supposed to be? He's shooting 36 percent from the field right now, 30 percent from the from the three point line. He is not getting I was looking at the numbers. He's getting to the rim 15 percent of his shots. And that is a career low. That's even lower than it was last year. And last year was not good. You know, he usually gets there 24, 25% of the time. Uh, so, you know, he's not a guy who's getting to the rim. He's not a great shooter. Uh, so what is he bringing? And, 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 and so for the Celtics, that's, that's the big question is, is uh, you know, Teague has been a disappointment. Uh, can Kemba get back? And then can Peyton Pritchard really be somebody that you rely on as a rookie uh, as we get down to the stretch run. That's that this point guard spot, which looked like such a strength not too long ago, is looking a little weak right now. What do you attribute that to for Kemba? You know, I, I've been listening to some of his post game press conferences, media availability lately, and it's not like these go on forever. They're only, you know, four, five, six minutes sometimes, but he's more or less asked about 
how do you feel and and how are you dealing with minutes restrictions and yeah how much do you love Tatum and Brown and and you know why isn't your shot falling because he had the six for 18 and 19 minutes the other night and you know Brad sort of defended that and saying you're just you're kind of out of energy when you're tailing Steph Curry the entire game and and you're not necessarily going to shoot efficiently but uh, you know to what you're saying about not going to the rim as much as maybe he has historically. Do you think with the knee, he's just, he's, he's afraid of getting banged around. I mean, I, I guess as, as you bring it up, I'm sort of surprised he hasn't been asked about that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think some of it might be mental and, and just being afraid to do it. I think some of it is physical too, that, that, that he just can't do it uh, as much as he used to with, with, with the knee problem that he's had, uh, you know, they haven't really explained. And this is something that I, 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 I would like to get, kind of the the full dossier on this whole thing uh you, you know what's going on with the knee what 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 because this is something that think about it it was a year ago that this started it was in january of 2020 yep. that the knee thing started with kemba and and you know for something to just kind of last that long and then get the stem cell well what's wrong like what is the actual injury uh, I don't think we've got a clear answer on that. And so we don't know. So, you know, you've got, you've got this thing with Kemba Walker where, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly wondering about what's going on. Uh, you know, is he fully healthy or all that? But we don't know what he's actually healthy against, what he's trying to get healthy against. Like, what is, what is it that, that needs to heal? What needs to feel better? Uh, you know, this is an injury that he's had for a while, even, even going back to the days in Charlotte. Uh, so, you know, it, is this just some kind of chronic thing? Is there a fix to it? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and if it is a chronic thing, then are the Celtics on the hook for the next couple of years here for 35 million bucks a year for a guy who's going to be a 36% shooter? Who's the right person to ask that question to? I mean, Ainge is, is not going to answer it any more honestly than than he wants or is able to and he's not going to obviously invade anyone's medical privacy you know brad would and and this is not even a criticism of danny of brad of 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 kemba of anybody but like you ask these you're not going to get full transparency on this right from danny certainly from brad i feel like kemba would be probably the most forthcoming if you were to try and ask that question to him i don't know how much you're going to get out of him either yeah kemba's not the chattiest guy so right. I think that he's, that's not going to be something he's going to want to talk about. And yeah, I mean, so, so we're kind of left with this vague knee injury, but we don't really know exactly what it is. There's nobody we can compare it to and say, Hey, this guy had something similar. Um, you know, is it, is it, is it, is it an ACL thing where, uh, you know, there's maybe a, some kind of minor tear or, or, or something where it's stretched too far. All these things can happen uh, to a knee uh, and, and, and not require a major surgery. Uh, I think I think teams uh, tend to be very honest and upfront when there is a major surgery, uh, mm-hmm. because that hasn't happened with Kemba. We just don't have the answers to that. Yeah, it, it is frustrating. And with Kemba, like I said it before, if they don't have, if it's just Jason and Jalen, and you know uh, a hodgepodge of other parts, and like I'm not trying to say that you know Tristan Thompson has been better lately, Daniel Tice has been better lately, and you know Smart does smart stuff, whatever. But they're not going to compete for an Easter Conference Finals appearance or a Finals appearance or an NBA title for that matter, if you want to go that far, without him being you know uh, a, a, a huge part of their offense, right? They're, he, they're not going anywhere. As much fun as watching the Jays are, you know, he is that quote unquote big X factor that they need to get them over the top. Cause you look at the rest of the Eastern conference, right? We talk this all the time, you know, there, there's, you know, a dynamic duo in place almost everywhere. Brooklyn's got three guys that are all all-stars and, you know, all NBA guys. You look at you know, Milwaukee and what they've done between holiday and Middleton and Giannis, like those are three pretty awesome players. You look at Tobias Harris's resurgence in Philadelphia. They got three pretty prominent. Well, I'd say two and a half pretty prominent scores. Boston seems to be lacking in that department. Kemba gives you at least the ammo you would need to keep up with those teams on an offensive, you know, in an offensive way. And especially when you think about their defense, like your defense has not been great at all. We've talked about this pretty much every week. I feel like on the show, Adam, their defense has been so bad. Mm-hmm. They need all the offense they can get just to stay in games. If their defense, John is going to be this bad. So, as, you know, look, as I don't, freak out about last night's loss because of the way that they're, they've been depleted in that department. I will hop on this bandwagon with you and say like, we need to figure out what the hell's going on with Kimba Walker because I mean, if he's, if he's not going to play in back to backs, I totally understand that they're trying to, you know, manage this incorrectly. But to your point, what are they managing exactly? 
you know, what, what is, what is the big problem here to the point where like, okay, we can't allow Kemba to play in back to backs, you know, ex- why exactly? Why, why can't he play, you know, 20, why couldn't he play t- like only it would be 15 minutes of Kemba Walker last night. It would have been a different outcome. They didn't need a lot of Kemba Walker last night. She needed a little bit of it. Just give him a little bit of a spark. Because again, when you're, when your point guard rotation is Jeff Teague, <laughs> um, Jeff Teague, Trey Waters, Carson Edwards, and Jason Tatum mostly, you're going to, you're not going to win a lot of basketball games. So right. Right. Just on top of play. that too, if, if he can't play, you know, back to backs, why can't he play, 35 minutes in a given game right exactly so to Sean's point even though I I'm a little more optimistic about the game last night we still have to get back to this Kemba Walker you know if he if he's not going to be 100% he's not going to and then, then what is what is really going on here and and if 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 it's not going to be something that's going to be solvable or it's something that they don't they're not going to describe it and they're not going to really tell you um do, do they have to you know you know we've talked about this I'm sure people have, have talked about this as well but are they going to have to maybe move on from Kemba here or do they have to get something else on the team to, you know, to compensate for a, you know, a, 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 uh, a gimpy. So, so to speak, Kemba walkers, because, you know, if he's not going to be part of the, you know, part of the offense, like they need him to be, well, they need more offense now because their, their defense has been absolute garbage. Uh, and that, that might be part of the reason why they don't want to be very explicit about what's going on with Kemba is because, if you if you have to make a trade down the line, you know, uh, in the end, everybody's going to wind up knowing what's wrong with it. Like if you if you if you want to trade them, then then the other team is going to ask these questions. But uh, certainly, you don't want to put it out there uh, as much as you need to. You want to be as, as quiet about it as possible uh, because if, if if it does wind up being a trade situation, I can't imagine. I've I've I've, I've talked about this with other people around the league that that. Right now, you couldn't, you just couldn't get rid of Kemba Walker, even if you were just trading him into a trade exception. Like mm-hmm. nobody wants the guy because of the lack of performance, because of the uncertainty about the knee and the contract, and 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 that's where the Celtics are right now with him. So they, you're right, they need him to get back to what he was, uh, or, or 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 something close to it, or else you know they're they're sort of stuck here. Boy, Ev, there's your there's your headline, huh? Are our interns listening? Nobody wants Kemba Walker. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh yeah that's not great it's not where you want to be you're, you're, what second year into this contract here with Kemba Walker it's not it's not where you want to be especially because the, the money that's attached to him look we all love Kemba it's not like saying we don't love Kemba I love you know he's just a great teammate he's, it's hard to find like a bad story to say about Kemba Walker well, this is I mean this isn't Kemba Walker the person this is yeah. at this stage it's Kemba Walker the player right yeah and if, and, if and, and maybe you know I maybe we're sitting here and we're thinking about this in, in the wrong fashion. Maybe this is a team that already knows that can't compete with the Brooklyn's and, and Philly right now and all that. And they're just, you know, look, we're going to buy time with Kemba and hope maybe, I mean, I don't think they're thinking this, but maybe they are. I don't know. Uh, the, the, we've got to buy time with Kemba here. This is not really the team that we think is going to compete for a title where we're really just kind of managing uh, our assets until the next off season where then the next off season, be, but that feels sort of like not like a waste but it sort of feels like a waste you know you have a team that, that's gone to the eastern conference finals you know what three of the fat past four years like mm-hmm. and, you know you're knocking the door for so long eventually you got to knock it down and get to the next step and it, you know as much as we want to revel in the fact that this team is you no know, they're exceeding expectations right you know they've you know jason and jalen are jalen is only 24 and jason's 22 yeah but at some point like you have to make progress you have to get over the hump to the next step. Like, it, you know, you know, coming in second place all the time is great, but you know what's better? Winning a championship. And eventually you'll be, you'll be known for your downfalls. And if that's, if that's the case, you were like, oh, maybe we're not really competing. Then what the hell are we doing here? I mean, this is what it is. And if to get back to the nobody wants Kim a Walker piece, well, then, then this team's in a whole lot of trouble because they got a $32 million plus point guard that nobody wants and is, is functional. It just feels like, Again, as, as, as we try and, and, and stand back and, and look at things from a bird's eye view here, as much as you want to talk about the progression of some guys, again, they're not going anywhere without Kimball Walker. And, it, and it's, it really is just a, a, a weird place to be right now, considering this is a weird season in, in general. Yeah, I mean, we're nowhere close to this, but eventually, the eventually, uh, I need to highlight that the conversation does become, you know, well, Jalen Brown's only 29 and Jason Tatum's only 27. Like, what the hell's been going on for the last They just eight? entered their prime, Adam. They just entered it. It's yeah. still time. <laughs> I, I remember when the when the uh when New Orleans signed 
Anthony Davis to, uh, to, to a contract, extension, his rookie contract extension, right? So uh, one that was only a few years ago, is like four years ago, five years ago. Uh, and I wrote, the minute that they signed him, I wrote a story about they are on the clock now. They've got to win or else he's going to want out. And I heard from so many Pelicans fans who were, what do you think? Just sign the guy. How can you say that? You don't even know. And, and that's where it got. I mean, those, th- that time moves fast. These seasons move fast. And, and, and if you don't produce, then you wind up in the situation where the Pelicans were, uh, you, you know, last year. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the reality of this. Might have to bring our guy Seal and Parekh back, huh? Get Dr. P. Yeah, see if we can crack some details on this knee injury. I'm still mad about the fact that we took a lot of flack for that. Uh, and you did. I didn't take any flack because I was just a, the, the producer on the particular thing. But I, I watched it all. There's a lot of flack for that podcast on Kyrie Irving. And, and, and Dr. P was right, right. pretty much about everything. So, yeah. you know. Nailed every little detail. All right. So let's circle back. Just uh, it, It's relevant to last night's game, but it's more of a big picture thought. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm watching – you know, on league pass, every team's game, every single night to know exactly how all their, their late game situations are handled. And I'm sure there's, there's a lot of overlap team to team. This isn't purely a Celtics issue, but when we're watching the Celtics every night, it feels like a Celtics issue. And it it comes back to coaching. Admittedly, when you have, there are just some going back in the day, like I didn't love the Paul Pierce isolation stuff. I really didn't. It was too predictable. It was, not it was it wasn't easy to to defend per se because you know if Pierce was going to get the best of his guys he did so many times it was going to be successful but that's not me sitting here advocating for you know Jason Tate Jason Tatum uh, iso ball I mean we saw it earlier this year at one point I didn't like it. it it wasn't the right move it was a bad shot the timing was bad they ate you know just ran down the clock for no reason when they could have set up a play it doesn't always make sense but there are times that you would rather see that or a play drawn up for Brown or a play drawn up for Kemba, even, you know, as opposed to like down by three, Javante green is going in for a contested dunk as he did late in the, in the final minute last night, or, you know, you got Tatum and Brown and Walker all on the floor, but let's Marcus smart, Jack up a three. And, and, and I'm like the leader in the clubhouse when it comes to Marcus smart can be a good three point shooter you know, defenders club. So it's not even an anti-smart thing. I just, they're the late game execution, the late game plays and and not specific to ATOs. We know, you know, the, the wizard wizardry at the whiteboard, you know, for Brad Stevens in the past, but there are just, there are these fleeting moments late in games that feel like they are truly difference making that I, I they're now that we're at a point where they're getting a little frustrating. Yeah, and, and I think that that one of the things that the Celtics have done over the years uh, under Brad Stevens uh, has been run the offense. They've they, they've always just sort of run the offense, and and that's a lot of ball movement, uh, and that's that's what they should do for forty six minutes. <laughs> to get to those final two minutes, I do think you need to change. I do think you need to say we got to find a way to get the ball into the hands of our best players and 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 the guys who can win us the game. Um, you know, you mentioned Pierce, you know, if you can get Pierce on the elbow, you do it every single time and, and, yeah. and I'll live and die with that shot every time. Uh, and, and you think about that, what's the equivalent uh, of that on the Celtics? You know, what's, what's that go to sort of play where they're going to live and die with this shot. I don't think they have one. I, I don't, I don't think that's, that's, that's a, uh, a factor with this team. Uh, and, and you get down to these, these, these close situations uh, and, you know, it, it it, it, it shouldn't be egalitarian <laughs> offense at that point. It should be, uh, let's get the ball uh, uh, to our 1%. That, 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 that should be, you should, you should get the ball to the elite players that you have, the guys that you're paying the 30 million bucks. Um, and, and, you know, we mentioned Kemba uh, and, you know, the shot that he took a few nights ago, I forget which Lakers. one. Yeah, Lakers. Yeah, I guess Lakers, right, right, right. I was okay with that. Uh, but again, like I would still rather see somebody else take that shot, you know, just, just, uh, I would rather see something set up for either Tatum or Brown to take that shot, especially Brown, the way he was playing, uh, in that game. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's an element where they, they, they kind of continue to run the offense in those situations and they should. Yeah. With, with Tatum too, you know, Tatum's got that step back that he just loves and he just. You know, we saw it against Milwaukee in the opener over Giannis, and he hit it over Giannis twice in that game, and it was like, 
you know, one of those days where Tatum's got that shot rolling. I, you know, it's not my favorite shot in the world. He seems to hit it quite a lot. So, you know, to it's not my favorite shot, but it goes in. So I'll live with it sort of thing. But after a while, it gets repetitive, it gets old. And it's like, all right, well, if that's the only thing you got in, your, in the bag at that point, then, you know, I think taking a fadeaway 28 footer is not the best use of your, of, you know, your skills and your talent. You know, if, if you take that shot a little bit, you know, closer to the basket, I don't have as big of a problem with it, but you know, to back up what Sean saying, yeah, the ball's got to find probably Tatum or Brown at the end of the game, find a switch that you like and, and have those guys go to work one-on-one -on -one and try and, and with Brown, like get him in anywhere in the mid range. He's been unbelievable. In the mid range this year, he's been spectacular at it. Um, you know, with Tatum, if you can get a smaller defender on him, and give him the opportunity to get a little closer to the basket, back his guy down. Cause he's been a great post player this year, Jason Tatum, find a way to get him in the post, you know, back down a smaller guy and, and get hit a turnaround or, or whatever. Like that's, it's probably gonna end up in a better shot than, than being so far away from the basket. Sometimes I think guys get obsessed with the, like the sports center highlight of like, I just hit a step back three over Giannis or I hit one over Anthony Davis. Look how cool this is. And so you know what else is cooler though is wins. And I'd rather have a shot a little closer to the basket. Again, I don't have any problem with, with Kemba's shot. You know, Kemba's got that killer step back game as well. We all re remember the one over McGee in the Big East champion, the Big East tournament against uh, Pittsburgh. You know, the one at the top of the key there, he's been kind of made that shot as his, you know, staple shot of his, his career. Um, but I, I, I prefer to see something a little bit different there. I agree with Sean that at the end of the games, like the offense needs to stop. You got to get the ball in the hands of your best players. But I do want to bring something up that, that Dwayne Wade said the other night. At the, I think it was during the halftime of the Golden State game. And he says, you know, look, he's like, look, Jason Tam can make any shot. We've all already seen it. He's 22 years old. He can make any shot that he takes on the basketball court. If he's taken it, he's made it a thousand times if he's made it once. The thing with Tatum that he has to do and be better at is, is finding a way to, to make sure his teammates stay engaged and that they can help carry him a little bit as, you know, the game gets on and when he needs to really kick it in, he actually has the energy for it at the end of the game. This is kind of, kind of, I saw this last night a little bit because there were times in the Sacramento game where Tatum looked gassed and he was still just shooting way too much. And it was like, you know, like, again, I appreciate the fact that you're taking responsibility try to will this team along and try and get them through this game with a win. But at some point you have to trust your teammates and you have to conserve your energy for the end of games when the games get tight and, and defense gets a little ratched up a little bit and you need to make a shot one-on-one -on -one against somebody. And when you've been shooting and using all your energy throughout the rest of the game, you don't have it at the end, you know, instead of trying to get by your guy at the end of the game to get to the basket, you're settling for a 28 foot step back. So, you know, Finding again, as long as the ball gets to Tatum or Brown or Kemba at the end of the game, I'm okay with it. How they figure that out, how they navigate the defense is on them. But the one thing with Tatum is he's got to learn that next part of how to conserve energy. So at the end, when you need to be Paul Pierce, you need to isolate Al Harrington and get a bucket. You can without, without looking like you're exhausted by the time you get there. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean, I, I think that's, that's, he could stand to kind of watch LeBron and, and the way that he manages a game. Uh, as so a, Wade, Wade said that exact sentiment uh, that in the halftime show. Exactly. Right. Right. Find, find your spots and, and, uh, and know when, you know, now I'm going to let everybody get involved. I'm going to set up people. I'm going to, you know, be a little bit of a decoy. And now I'm going to assert myself whether, and sometimes it's comes in the second quarter or third quarter, whatever. Uh, but, but you want to have that, uh, for the certainly for the final six minutes, you want to kind of set up. It's almost like a like a pitcher who lets somebody get a single off them uh, on a pitch uh, in the first inning, knowing that in the seventh inning they can go. Oh, pitchers don't go seven seven innings anymore, but yeah. in the sixth inning they can uh, uh, they can come back and get a strikeout with the pitch that 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 maybe th they can fool them to make it look like what they what they threw in the first inning. That's that's something that yeah, Tatum, you know, thinking the game that way. As, as a whole 48 minute unit rather than than just go 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 all the time uh, I think that 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 is something that uh, uh, especially if you're going you know with the skill that he has man with the I mean he's got elite level skill he just you're right that that's like the thing that mental aspect that can bring him kind of to the next level there and and, and win games so with regard to winning games and helping this team out of course Danny Ainge the team's President of Basketball Operations did his weekly interview with 98.5 The Sports Hub in Boston earlier this morning. And Sean, you were tweeting a little bit about this, Ainge's comments. He was asked 
what Boston's biggest need is with the trade exception, that massive TPE that the C's have uh, almost a, a calendar year to use. So there is no urgency other than the people that would just like to, you know, see them use it now and improve this specific team. But obviously they could use it in the off season and, you know, put it toward next year's team, so to speak. But he said, Shooting with size, says the team's looking for a, a complete player who can help defensive focus to uh, call the trade deadline the sweet spot for likely using the TBE. So obviously that's, you know, not too far away. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad at least, and, and you acknowledge this on Twitter that, that, you know, should probably squash the, you know, JJ Redick rumors that uh, Sham Sharania had put out the other day saying that the Pelicans were looking to maybe trade him to a team in the Northeast, be it the Celtics, the Nets, the Sixers. And, it, you know, I, I tweeted quite a few times about how it's, it just, it makes no sense. It makes no sense bringing in JJ Redick and almost 37 year old JJ Redick having the worst year of his career, by the way, and using half, if not more than half, based on where the Celtics are in, in the salary cap right now on a JJ Redick, you know, you, pipe dream you know people keep talking about Nick Vucevic and you know Aaron Gordon pre-injury and guys like that like guys who are you know have have been or or still can be will be project to be all-stars mid to late 20s you know guys who are just maybe in bad spots and for whatever reason the team wants to unload them because they don't want to pay them down the road but there are there are building block guys which JJ Redick is not and Danny Ainge and I don't have to tell Danny anything he doesn't know already he's smart enough to know that you don't waste the TPE an historically huge trade player exception on a guy like JJ Redick to help a team that still doesn't put you over the hump no right and and a guy who you can probably get, I, I'll tell you exactly where that rumor came from. It came from David Griffin and in, in, uh, in the Pelicans front office, because what he wants to do is create a market for JJ Reddick that he knows ain't there. There's no market for, for JJ Reddick, uh, you know, with his age, with what he does defensively with, uh, with, with, with the way he's played this year, uh, you know, he's a buyout candidate. And then everybody knows if you wait till April, you can sign him uh, with a buyout, you know? So uh, it, it, that, that's where that came from. You know, JJ Reddick was never really going to be uh, somebody that was going to come with the Celtics. Uh, you, you know, the question becomes, okay, who can, and, and do you get a short-term fix, you know, a LaMarcus Aldridge, for instance, who, you know, is a free agent after this year, probably not somebody you're going to sign, uh, you know, maybe if, if he were to stay on a reasonable deal, you would, but, uh, uh, but you know, not, obviously he's, he's in his mid thirties too, uh, but could help you this year and, 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 and could, could be that kind of stretch for uh, that this team has, has lacked, uh, you know, pretty much since the, uh, since the early 2000s, since, since Antoine Walker, right? Uh, you know, it's 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 a tough question because you're right. Because if a team gets in a position where they say, uh, "All right, we want to get rid of this guy," and and we just kind of want to get rid of him, we don't really, we don't need anything back. We just want to get rid of him. whatever it is, whatever the reason is. Uh, that then the Celtics want to keep that there uh, for that reason. Uh, problem is that that's probably not going to happen. So what are you going to do? Are you going to find somebody who can help you this year? Are you going to find somebody who can help you going forward? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a tough question because you have to decide uh, when to pull the trigger. And once you pull the trigger, there's no one pulling it. You, you can't, you can't, you can't redo it. You only get one shot with this, with this uh, TPE. So uh, it's a tough situation for Danny. Uh, I think when you look at the market, when you look at what's out there, they're probably going to, I, I, I think the, in the end, uh, they're going to have to find somebody who can help them this year, and probably not somebody who's going to help them much longer. You know, Harrison Barnes would be would be to me the ideal fit, just because uh, you know he's he's he would fit well. Uh, he he does everything that 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 they're looking for. Uh, he is overpaid, and 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 you're you're not getting out of that contract uh, after this year. Uh, but uh, but but if they could make that work, he's probably the best. Uh, uh, the, the best guy you get. But then, of course, you have to sit back and say, all right, basically we traded Gordon Hayward for, for Harrison Barnes, and, and that's a loser. That's a loser of a deal. No, no other way to say it. Better than getting nothing. Better than getting nothing. Yeah, yep. that's, but you're, you're going to be a loser regardless of how it goes down because Gordon's been playing out of his mind this year. And yeah. I'd like to apologize to Gordon Hayward and the, and the Charlotte Hornets for calling them a lame franchise basically earlier in the year and thinking that they had no prospects. Uh, they've been super fun to watch. And Gordon's been unbelievable, but whoever you get back, is just not going to be 
nearly as good as Gordon is. He's been outrageous this year. And, you know, guys with size, you know, well, Boston's a small team. You look at, you know, they're, they're playing, like, is Jason Tatum, like the new height of Jason Tatum, is he the tallest guy they have on the floor at all times? It just seems like it. You know, Tristan Thompson's not really, you know, a, a super overly tall guy. He doesn't really play. I mean, he plays big to a point, but he's not, he's not an explosive athlete. You know, Rob, I love Rob Williams to death, and he's, you know, starting to kind of figure it out, and his his numbers are starting to really trend in a really positive direction, but can we can he count on that for an entire season? You know, we'll find out. You know, Daniel Tice, as good as he is as a shooter and does all the little things you need, again, he doesn't play super big. So the, the question is, you know, how big does that guy need to be? And how you know, how does he need to be – do you sacrifice more for defense or more for shooting? Because you're going to have to find – like I've always liked Larry Nance as a guy that, that they could go after to bring in who's a really superb defender, one of the – you know, in terms of steals per game, he's either at the top of the list or very, very close to it this season. Um, he gives them a wing defender, which they could use to give Jason and Jalen some time off and Marcus some time off as the primary wing defender – but does he really bring that shooting and that scoring aspect he might need? Maybe not. That's where Harrison Barn comes into play. And Nikola Vucevic, if that's even a, a realm of possibility, um, that's where those guys come into play, guys that can really shoot. Um, you know, Vuce is a bigger body, but not necessarily as versatile defensively as Harrison Barnes. Barnes is a better, you know, uh, a switchable defender, but, you know, doesn't give you the size that you possibly – so, you know, it's, there's not going to be that perfect fit that Boston can find to really insert – to really put them, you know, in a different stratosphere of team. They might find – they might luck into it with a Harrison Barnes. Um, but there's just not that slam dunk can- – I mean, the, the guy that I would have loved is the guy currently kicking ass in, in Houston. That's Christian Wood. Mm-hmm. But I, I – unless you're going to offer some ridiculous bounty for Christian Wood, I don't think Fertitta's going to let that guy go because he's been just unbelievable on both ends of the floor this year. So – you know, as, as in, I'm sure you guys get it way more than I do, but like, what are the Celtics going to do with their TPE? Well, as we get closer to March and closer to that date, we still have no clarity on it because mm-hmm. there are so many teams that are like in the periphery, kind of, hey, we maybe we get into that play in game. Maybe we can sneak in and do this, and do that. We have no idea how this is going to go and who's available. And, and, you know, it, it might just be like a week before all of a sudden the, you know, the, the leaves start falling off and, and you have a little clearer picture. But right now, we, you have really no idea who's available and who's not because kind of everybody, unless you're Detroit um, or, or, or the Wizards, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of hanging around or, or, or the Timberwolves, like you're kind of hanging around. I, I just don't know where that, that trade partner is right now, Sean. Well, here, here's your uh, weekly reminder, too, that you can't get Bradley Beal. You can't afford him for all the people that are insistent upon that <laughs> happening. I will add John Collins to your list that you mentioned before. I love him. That's a guy that I – he's not coming, but that's a guy that I'd love to see here. Um, before just, you know, letting Sean go to answer your question, how about inserting this? I mean, if it, short of acquiring Aaron Gordon, because no one's doing that right now with the injury, his injury might actually help increase the odds of landing a guy like Vooch because Orlando is going to fall off. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Orlando has been pretty, you know, teams have been calling about Aaron Gordon for, for two years. Uh, and they've been pretty staunch in the fact that, that, that they weren't going to trade him, even as he had Vucevic doing what he's doing. And, 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 and it was clear that, that they were putting a lot into, uh, uh, into Jonathan Isaac. Um, but, you know, Isaac's out for the year. Um, and, and, and with Gordon, basically, you know, that right now, I mean, look, you've got Isaac's out for the year. Uh, uh, Markel Fultz is out for the year. Uh, you've got Gordon's going to miss, uh, at least a month and a half. Uh, so yeah, if you're the magic, you've got to start considering, uh, where are we going with this? You know, I mean, this is even at their best, even when all those guys are healthy, they're about, you know, a, a little bit over 500. That's, that's the kind of team they are. They're a, a, a six seed and, and probably losing the first round at their best. Uh, right. but, uh, but, you know, where they are now, they've, they've really got to consider, uh, you know, blowing this thing up and, and, and starting over. They've, they've got some decent pieces to work with, uh, and, and, and that's positive for them. Uh, but you're right. You know, this Aaron Gordon injury is kind of forcing them into a corner where, they got to decide what they're going to do with this group. So uh, in the interest of time, we only have a few more minutes. I want to make sure we get to this. Uh, Evan and I are so used to news breaking after our shows. This is a nice change of pace. 
the Shamsharania, the NBA and the Players Association have agreed to host the All-Star Game March 7th in Atlanta. Sides are finalizing details of a plan as soon uh, as Thursday. Thursday is today, even though the news came out today. So it's possible we will know that much more after the show. But at last reports anyway, not going to be a whole full weekend thing like in the past because of obviously the pandemic. It would be a, a game and skills competition happening in the same day. Players could be named All-Stars and uh, still you know, opt out, decide not to go, understandably so. But I bring that up in part because... Uh, I wanted to outline this. De'Aaron Fox said after his monster game against the Celtics last night, I mean, just truer words have not been spoken. De'Aaron Fox was asked about the all-star game proposal in Atlanta. And he said, if I'm going to be brutally honest, I think it's stupid. We said this last week with Mark D'Amico and we just kind of, you know, we grazed over it. We moved on. Now that it is official, I think this is just to, to, to quote Tom Cruise in, uh, in The Firm, I think, or A Few Good Men, one of those. This is a galactically stupid idea on the part of the NBA, which is generally speaking under Adam Silver, especially during the pandemic, been so remarkably responsible with how the league has handled all of this. And now, out of the bubble, having so many games postponed or, or you know, canceled last minute. Uh, you know, you had the Denver-Detroit situation the other night contact tracing now we're going to take players from all over the country and put them into one city for a night or two to have an all-star game and yeah sure you have to follow protocols and be tested and everyone has to test negative like i get all that i get i get the the you know people that would be out there rebuffing what i'm saying but this is so unnecessary and dumb you want to say that guys should be named all-stars tatum brown whomever else and and get the bonuses that are in their contract like sure of course i'm not anti that like i'm not i'm not anti economics but let's let's not play a meaningless exhibition to have a showcase to you know give everyone a, a platform for for one more night in still the heart of a pandemic when this just doesn't need to be done sean yeah and it's uh you know it, it, this is about the broadcasters there's, there's yeah. no question that this is all about uh, uh getting the night of tv in uh, that's in the contract, so it's something that they don't have to pay back that money. That's that's what this all comes down to. Um, I think if I were the broadcasters, and I I, I would kind of recognize that probably nobody's going to watch this thing, and 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 the the negativity that's going to arise from it because you're going to have so many players say no, no, I'm not I'm not going. Uh, that it's it's the cost benefit analysis here has to be not worth it. And, and uh, you know, that, that there had to be some other form of broadcasting, you know, something else that you could put there, um, you know, be creative, but, but, uh, but, but don't have an all-star game. I mean, it's just, uh, it just, you know, they finally got to the point, like they have no COVID tests, nobody tested positive this last, this last grouping. That's great. Considering where they were a couple of weeks ago, everything's moving in the right direction. And then you go and, you know, announce this, it just, doesn't make sense for one thing on a, on a COVID level. It also doesn't make sense on, look, you know, the Lakers and the Heat had 70 days off before they had to start the season again, like 70 days, give them a week off, give them four or five days, whatever, whatever the, uh, the length of the break is here, give them that entire time off. You know, don't, don't, don't do this. It just, I, I don't understand what the benefit is. You know, it, it to me, it's just the, the, the negative far outweighs the positive here. No, nothing to add to that. I don't think it's. I don't think it's a smart idea. I think if you want to, you know, do something charitable with it, you know, find a way yeah. to, mm -hmm. to, to 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 donate to charity and, and to in in you know be a part of this 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 group that wants to really raise awareness or social changes in this country. Do something with that. There's no need to have a game. I mean, if you want if you want to do something really positive, that feels like a better use of your time. It really does because I'm with Sean. Who who's if, if all these guys are saying no, who the hell is going to watch the game? Nobody. So oh, yeah. what's the point? Make it yeah. make it something. Again, the players, you know, would probably appreciate that a lot more anyway. And, you know, they're just better things you can do with your time. And and it just feels – it's just like, – like Sean said, it feels like a money grab. And, and it just feels wrong. And it, I don't think they should have it. And I think we should, again, give guys time off. Um, you know, relax, get your body right. Again, especially for the teams that played late, um, and just just be thankful for the fact that nobody's sick, and you're and you're keeping people from getting sick.
But if we're going to have fun with this thing, I mean, not that he would be named, but we all know Kyrie Irving would still go, right? <laughs> can't play regular season games for his team, but he'd go to an all-star game. Javante <laughs> Green there. for the contest. You know, like, <laughs> screw it. Just put Javante in there. He could, he's, he's fun to watch in transition, at least. Ugh. Kyrie will go if there's an Uncle Drew too that he needs to promote. That that the guy, Kyrie will be there if he needs to promote his next movie. That's for sure. I'll see it. Clippers coming up next to continue this road trip. That is tomorrow night. Another late game. These West Coast games are brutal. And then yeah. uh, in Phoenix Sunday afternoon, and then wrapping up the trip Tuesday night in Utah against for inexplicably the league's best team standings wise the utah jazz and then it's back home for uh, a game one week from today thursday against the raptors so we'll regroup probably sometime before then after the road trip and uh, let you know obviously how everything fell but this was a fun one fellas even if last night's result was not sean devaney and valenti i'm adam kaufman sean thanks so much all right thank you guys <laughs>